Welcome to Zip Code Zero. I'm Kevin Maley. In an economy with steady growth, low unemployment, and core inflation down to 3.2%, according to yesterday's report, why do so many Americans say that the Biden administration has left them worse off economically? How is Trump winning or tied with voters under the age of 30? And why are Democrats, once the party of the common man, continuing to lose support from the working class? And not just among white voters, but increasingly among non-white voters as well. To answer those questions, I'm joined today by Robert Kuttner. Robert is a journalist, writer, and scholar. He's a co-founder and co-editor of The American Prospect, as well as a professor at Brandeis University's Heller School. And he's an author of many, many great books, most recently Going Big, FDR's Legacy, Biden's New Deal, and the Struggle to Save Democracy, as well as 2018's Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism, which is one of my favorite books for understanding the post-war economic order and the rise of the neoliberal era. On the show, Bob and I hit on a wide range of topics, including Biden's prospects for re-election next year, whether Carter was our first neoliberal president, the state of the British and German economies, the elitism of the Democratic Party, free speech on campus, and much, much more. It's a heck of a show, folks. Always remember to hit the like button, subscribe, and share with your friends. It might just win you a free Zip Code Zero t-shirt. Enjoy the show. I wanted to start out with was basically this disconnect that we are seeing between how the economy is performing on paper and how voters perceive the economy. I'm sure you've seen loads of the polls showing Biden losing. He's losing to Trump in key states. But there's also just the voter perception of the economy. There's a poll out in the Financial Times this morning talking about, I think it said 14 percent of Americans think that Biden has improved their lives. Overwhelmingly, voters think the economy is worse off than it was a few years ago. There was a morning consult poll out this morning saying the same thing. We had very good numbers in the third quarter GDP and inflation has slowed down and gas prices are down. You can run through the numbers and all that. Why do you think there's such a disconnect between voters' perceptions on the economy and what the actual numbers on the economy are saying? Yeah, I think I think it's pretty straightforward, actually. And I think there's two parts to it. One part is the long term, short term problem. So if you look at long term, meaning the last 30 or 40 years, uh, ordinary people have been taking it on the chin for 30 or 40 years, thanks to neoliberal policies. So if you compare what the world looked like to a 30 year old uh, two generations ago, you could afford a house, you could go to college without uh, incurring debt, you could get a job that would probably turn into a career. Wow, that's that's big stuff. And you could expect to get uh, wage or salary increases, you know, if you did your job reasonably well. And also, by the way, 40 or 50 years ago, most people had pension plans. Now they have 401ks and people feel they can't afford their retirement. So if, if, as the British say, if life prospects have been slowly going down the drain for all but the very fancy professional class, you know, for two generations, and they get a little bit better under Biden, and that's part two of the problem, that's not going to change anything fundamental. I mean, if you go to a town that used to have a factory or that used to have a, you know, uh, an anchor industry that was also the hub of a whole region. And these are very much the towns in the upper Midwest that that Biden lost to Trump. You look at those counties that are mostly working class, that are below median income. Life has just gone to hell for regular people in those counties, and it's a long-term process. And the Democrats were as culpable as the Republicans in buying into this Wall Street-led shift uh, and the version of globalization where you had plant closings and people losing what were once good factory jobs. So that's the broader context. OK, now what's the immediate context? Well, the immediate context is that people have this vague recollection of 2017, 2018, 2019 before the pandemic 
that no inflation and life was not too bad and uh, mortgages were really cheap. And then you have the pandemic, which really starts on on uh, Trump's watch, but it's mostly on Biden's watch. And we have this couple of years of inflation. And there's a residue of that. I mean, food prices, grocery prices are still higher than people remember them. If you want to go out to eat, that's gone up and it's stayed high. And the killer is interest rates. So even though inflation, measured inflation is down, and that sort of cheers policy wonks, but credit cards and mortgages and anything that that uh, carries an interest charge, which again, ordinary people are relying on, seven seven percent, seven and a half percent, and we haven't had those kind of uh, interest rate numbers in, in, in 20 years. So you put that together, people, pe- oh, here's the other problem. The other problem is cognitive dissonance. And Biden says, hey, look how great the economy is, man. I've done all this great stuff. And the average person says, shit, it doesn't affect my life. And that undercuts Biden's credibility. So people like Stan Greenberg, who I think is the best pollster out there, is trying to say to the White House, would you please stop bragging about how great the economy is? Because that undercuts your credibility generally. And the White House can't stop doing it because they're proud of some of the things that Biden has accomplished. I think uh, the industrial policy stuff, you know, that's great. But you you look at all of these industrial policy bills, taking back production and green economy, and uh, none of that stuff is going to bear fruit for years. That's not going to create very many good jobs in the short run. So again, the more the more Biden brags about this stuff that that gets policy wonks kind of excited, the average person says, "Well, geez, I don't see this in my life." So I think that's the disconnect. And that's the simple explanation. It's not even that complicated. Do you think that is the reason that Biden is either losing or sort of tied with Trump on voters under 30? That's one of the more surprising figures that I saw in recent polls. Well, I think that's two things. I, I, I think, you know, so poor guy. I mean, here he really tries to deliver relief from student debt. And he gets cut off. Can't do it. Courts say he can't do it. So he tried, but the average person who just is sandbagged by student debt, and that's not just students, that's 40-year-olds as well as 30-year-olds and some 50-year-olds and 60-year-olds. So you have that. You have the fact that home ownership is impossible unless unless you have rich parents or unless you're an investment banker. What 30-year-old can dream of home ownership? And you know, when I was 30, year old, 30 years old, I was a homeowner. Housing was cheap. Mortgages were cheap. It wasn't that big a deal. And now it's like an impossible stretch unless you can get your parents to finance it. So it's one part, the fact that the gig economy and student debt and the cost of housing and all that stuff, not to mention that if you're serious about climate change, maybe you're worried that by the time you, you know, are 50, the planet will be a cinder. So that's sort of making 30 year olds be depressed. And so you add up all of that. You know, the conventional view, and I think it's right in political science, is that presidential elections are referenda on the incumbent. And for, for, for a 30 year old of no particular ideological bent, the economy doesn't look all that great. And then, of course, you have the two wars and particularly the Middle East. And, and I think when I was young, Israel stood for refuge from the Holocaust. And it was a kind of a social democratic labor Zionist government. So Israel looked like a good guy. If you're 30 years old, all you know about Israel is that the prime minister is Bibi Netanyahu, and he has been committing ethnic cleansing in the West Bank, and he's killing babies in Gaza. And and Biden not only looks like he's complicit, but he also looks like a patsy because he keeps telling Netanyahu to sort of damp it down a little bit. And Netanyahu says, sorry, I'm not going to do it. So not only is he going to bat for Israel at a time when young people are sort of appalled by by what Israel has been doing, but but he's giving Israel all this money and Israel is telling him, sorry, we're not going to take your advice. And I think Ukraine has been popular 
to the extent that it becomes more and more of a quagmire, it ain't so popular. So you've got two unpopular wars, one of which is really unpopular with people under 30. And I think much of the, the defection of, of people under 30 is dismay at what Biden is doing with Israel-Palestine. And there are polls on that. I mean, I think the time Siena poll last week that, that everybody went berserk about, I think that was overstated. I think that was maybe sample error. But but there's a big piece of the truth in in the general direction of what that poll finds. One thing that I've kind of wondered about for a while that I've not been able to fully understand, you'd mentioned the neoliberal period. There, there was a New York Times op-ed last week by Pamela Paul. It was on how the Democrats have turned their back on the working class, kind of the the story that Thomas Frank tells that, you know, used to be the the New Deal coalition and then kind of the Democrats sold out in the 80s with the DLC and kind of went from there. And this is when we started going to free trade and undermining the working class. What I've struggled to to grapple with is the Democrats lost a pretty big election in 1980, lost in a landslide in 1984, lost again in 1988, almost lost in 1992. So you had Bill Clinton come in. He's kind of the sort of the the first neoliberal Democrat, I guess you could say maybe. No, no, maybe maybe it was Jimmy Carter. All right. So so I think we can get back to that. There's your answer. Well, I mean, so Carter, Carter so, really screwed the pooch before before these other guys did. But go ahead. Well, so one thing I wondered that, you know, Reagan, that that sort of period is also compared a lot with in England. The Labor Party was very socialist at the time. Thatcher came in and then it was only under Tony Blair, who's under new labor, the kind of neoliberal period for the Labor Party wins in a landslide in 1997. So what what I'm getting at was. Were, did the Democrats stop being competitive and labor stop being competitive with a more working class oriented policy platform? It seemed like it was when they started to embrace the neoliberal policies that that's when they won, whether that's in England or in the United States. OK, well, let's let's unpack that. And, and everybody has their own selective history. So <laughs> let's 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 do the United States first. So and let's take a really good look at Jimmy Carter gets elected very narrowly, by the way. I mean, he almost doesn't, he just barely defeats Jerry Ford, who's the guy who pardoned Nixon. And he comes out of nowhere. I mean, I was working on the national desk at the Washington Post when 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 Carter declared for the presidency. And my editor said, this, this guy from Georgia is announcing at the National Press Club, would you please cover it? I was the only reporter from a national newspaper there uh, his his recognition rating, not his popularity rating, people who had heard of him was 2%. So he completely came out of nowhere. He didn't know anybody anything. And the mood of the country at that point was we want an outsider. And he was substantively the most conservative Democrat since Grover Cleveland. I mean, if uh, can you think of what, what Carter accomplished? What he accomplished was deregulation. What he accomplished was supply side economics. I mean, Carter presided over supply side tax cuts in 78, three years before Reagan. He he launched deregulation of airlines, trucking, oil. And the alcohol uh, industry. Yeah, uh, all of the deregulation starts under Carter. And this is the period, by the way, when outsourcing and loss of jobs to transplants that starts big time in the in the late 70s and of course the late 70s is also this period of stagflation the economy is just a complete disaster and some of that is opec's fault some of it is just bad luck so reagan comes in with a landslide mainly because carter is such a dismal president and and then Mondale, I mean, I covered this stuff very intensely at the time. You recall what Mondale ran on? Mondale Raising ran on, taxes. I'm going to raise your taxes. I'm going to raise your taxes. And by the way, I'm going to use the proceeds of the tax increase not to give you any benefits. I'm going to raise taxes to balance the budget. And the guy who wrote that speech was Robert Rubin. And so 
the the mm. Ruben. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Ruben influence on the on the uh, Democratic Party starts with Walter Mondale. So now, eighty eight. Interesting case. Dukakis should have won. I wrote a book on that, uh, but he didn't. I mean, he made a few blunders. He he got caught in the Willie Horton thing. He he got caught in the Rocky the Flying Squirrel thing, where he puts on a helmet and goes in a tank. It looks like an idiot, and and so Bush Bush won, squeaks through. Then in ninety two, you have a three way race, and Clinton only gets elected thanks to H. Ross Perot. I mean, Clinton gets elected with I think forty three percent of the vote. So at that point, and I lived this. At that point, the conventional wisdom is the only problem with the Democrats is that they're not enough like the Republicans, that the center of gravity is moved to the right and the New Deal is dead and Democrats need to be a kind of a more modern, more centrist party. And by the way, they need to be more more hard ass on crime. And and so Clinton buys this stuff and we have this very brief period of full employment that lasts maybe three years. And during that period, wages actually go up for, for ordinary people. But so Clinton is the guy who who buys into neoliberalism big time and globalization big time. And that's the point where life for ordinary working people takes another uh, bump downward. So the Blair story, I think, is a is a is a very different story. I, I mean, you have Thatcher getting elected with less than 50% of the vote every single time she ran <clears throat> because Britain has this first past the post system, but it's got three parties. And so the anti-Thatcher vote is divided among the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. And it takes 12 years or however many years she was in office for her to become sufficiently unpopular that that Tony Blair can get elected. And yeah, Blair Blair gets elected as a, you know, as an anti-Tory, as a modernizer, and as a kind of anti-trade union Tory. That the that the experience in Britain was that the Labour Party had become too beholden to the unions. Uh you had the 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 famous winter of discontent where all of the public sector unions are are on strike and the garbage is piling up and ambulances aren't getting through. And this is this is the last labor government. And this is James Callahan. And Thatcher gets elected in the wake of that kind of discontent with with the Labor Party being too beholden to the labor movement. And the British labor movement in that era is is very different from the American labor movement. It's more of a you know, class struggle kind of Marxian or neo Marx, quasi Marxian labor movement. And so Tony Blair comes in and says, we're not going to do that again. We're going to just really reduce the the influence of, of trade unions. And he sort of picks up where Thatcher leaves off in terms of making it hard to organize a union, making it hard to go on strike. And, you know, he has a he has a good run, but life for regular people doesn't get better. And I think that explains the fact that there have been Tory prime ministers ever since, except for this weird interlude w- with Corbyn, who was just a, you know, a disaster as a as a labor leader, but he never got to be prime minister. So you've had ever, ever since Blair left office and, and Brown gets defeated, you've had nothing but Tory prime ministers. So I think I think I, I I can still make a pretty good case that the whole neoliberal experiment was not good for working people, and that more importantly, it it undermined the faith of working class democratic voters in the Demo- in the Democratic Party, and the statistics on that are just overwhelming. That my my, my favorite statistic is the f- favorite is horrible, but but it's a very telling statistic that that as as recently as the nineteen 19- 96 election, uh, if you look at counties, counties that are at least 85% white, below median income, split evenly between between Clinton and Dole. And in 2016, Trump carries 652 of those counties and Hillary carries two. Two. 
So I think the white working class has just completely given up on the Democrats. And that began to change a little bit in 2020. We'll see whether the victories of the UAW and Biden's embrace of the UAW begins to change that a little bit, but it's going to be a very, very long road back. And in the meantime, Trump style economic nationalism and cultural backlash against bathrooms and LGBTQ and all the stuff that Hillary championed even further alienates the white working class. And it's it's going to be a very, very long road back and everything is going to have to break right. So now the Democrats are the party of of elected professionals and the Republicans are the party of white working class. And of course, that's ass backwards. And, and that's that's going on in every Western country. If you look at who backs the French left, it's well-educated people and the, the French working class is backing Le Pen. And the same same story, not quite as extremely, but same basic story in Germany, same basic story in Britain. And when you have the the nominally left party losing the working class and gaining the cultural lefties, something is really terribly wrong. So how do we stop that, though? Because <clears throat> Biden had made a, a little bit of gains with the white working class in 2020, but he started to lose black and hispanic working class now he's not losing them overall but i am sure you saw in that poll the siena poll and i I take your point on that that might have had issues in it but i even just in the 2020 election trump made inroads with the black working class with the hispanic working class it seems to be sort of reflected in the polls again he's not winning them but we're seeing movement there and it seems like the democratic party is in this unbreakable I don't know what you call it, a spiral of more and more, you know, the more educated you are, the more likely you're to vote for the Democratic Party. They're staffing the party. They're creating the policy of the party. Now we're increasingly having this division on language. And I think that speaks to some of the the woke issues that you were referring to, where the working class even feels alienated if they're not using the right words or terms. And then they feel lectured if they're if they say the wrong thing. How do we stop that? Yeah, and it's even it's even harder, by the way, when you don't have Congress. So so even if Biden had a more Rooseveltian kind of strategy, which he sort of tried to do with student loans, and and he's done it by going after pharma. I think that's one of the smartest things he did, because ordinary people really resent being being ripped off by the drug companies. I mean, uh, you got to be more populist, and and let me unpack the word populist. Populist gets thrown around as a kind of a, a, of a bad term, meaning jingoist or uh, racist or uh, white nationalist or what have you. And John Judas wrote the book on this, and it's a brilliant book. There's two kinds of populism. There's right wing populism and there's left wing populism. And, you know, right wing populism is all the bad things that's attributed to the word populism. Left wing populism is sort of working people against Wall Street. And that's exactly what got Roosevelt elected. And it's it's what it's what Biden and company need to do more of. And the difficulty is that when you don't have Congress. It's really hard to deliver. And I think Biden has done not a bad job using his executive authority to deliver in some respects. I think someone like Stan Greenberg would say, well, what you do is you say, if you elect me and elect the Democratic majority to the House and Senate, these are the five things we're going to do that are going to make a dramatic difference for the better in your life. You be forward looking. And I think the good news for Democrats is that, as as last Tuesday showed, um, voters tend to be with them on the issues. And it's not just abortion. But the problem is that Biden is a terrible messenger, even for his own program. And so (laughs) anybody other than Biden would be a better messenger for Biden's program, even though Biden's program falls short of everything the Democrats need to do. And that gets to the other conundrum that, you know, everybody in the Democratic Party off the record will say, God, uh, somebody else ought to run. 
And nobody in the Democratic Party other than Dean Phillips has the nerve to say that to Biden's face. So that's the other absolute catastrophe that that potentially faces the Democrats. I mean, he's he is not going to be a good candidate. And it's it's one part. <clears throat> People don't appreciate his policies for all the reasons I described on the economy. People are recoiling from his policies on foreign policy, and he's too old. And it's not just that he's too old. It's that he looks too old. It's that he trips on his words. And he he is, every time Biden's off the cuff, all of his staff is holding their breath, waiting for the next stumble. And Trump is only three years younger than Biden, but Trump comes across as forceful and he comes across as clever off the cuff, even though a lot of the cleverness is demented, but he comes off as high energy and Biden comes off as low energy. And so that's yet another problem for the Democrats. So then what happened with Build Back Better? Because that was the the big version of it. Obviously, there were a few different versions of this, but Joe, Joe Manchin happened. Yeah, I know people say that, but no, it, but it's what happened. It's it's Biden's version of 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 Build Back Better, which ended up being one part. The I I, I lose track of them. I, I I mean, it's the bipartisan infrastructure bill or bipartisan yeah. infrastructure. Act. It, the the stripped down version of Build Back Better was what Manchin and to a lesser extent cinema would allow Congress to pass. That's that's what happened to Build Back Better. So the question is, you know, do you say, well, if you give me a real majority, Manchin's gone anyway, we will resurrect the following things. We'll have we'll have the child the refundable child tax credit, which was really a, a child allowance for any parent of a kid under 18. And that was a lot of money. And that was not income tested. So everybody got it. And that was popular. But and, can I can I pause you on that one, though? Because yeah, sure. so that the child tax credit credit, it, it cut child poverty in half. Biden, it was part of, I think, one of the covid relief bills on a temporary basis. And he wanted to make it permanent and build back better. Didn't wind up happening. Uh, it expired and it expired without much fanfare. I mean, we've seen child poverty go up effectively doubled to what it was before the child tax credit was in. But you didn't see this clamoring from the public. I think the Democrats had this hypothesis that once you give them a benefit, the public will latch on to it like Social Security and like Obamacare. And maybe they, you know, the idea is it just needs to be around longer. A year is not enough. But it did just kind of expire without much fanfare at all. What do you make of that? I think it was an organizing failure. I mean, I think they failed to organize the public. I mean, there's no, you know, the public is very amorphous. And but I think you you made a very important point. Look at Social Security. Social Security has been around long enough that nobody dares mess with it. And and Trump, Trump was ahead of the rest of the Republican pack on that. He sort of preempted it. I'm not going to touch Social Security because he's a very shrewd politician, as crazy as he is. So I think if they had managed to kind of keep it for four years, it would have been much harder to take away. And they didn't do they didn't do their job in organizing a, a constituency for it. And, you know, if you did have a working majority in both houses, you could do a lot of stuff that would begin to win back the working class. But I'm I'm just worried sick about Biden as the standard bearer. And it's, so it's you know, it's it's one part the economy has not changed enough on his watch to make people feel that he's done something fundamentally different. And it's one part of him. When when you say one of the failures on the child tax credit was the the Biden folks or the Democrats in general didn't organize a constituency for it. I wonder if that's one of the issues, because when you think of older Democratic policies like Social Security or even health care, the constituency was already organized and it sort of came from the bottom up in ways that there's clamoring for these policies, maybe not in that exact form, but the idea of a, a government pension, for example, you had pressure from, I think, Huey Long for even, an even more dramatic government pension, you know, that eventually becomes Social Security. Does the government have to like, is that an issue that the idea that the government 
a policy might be thought of in the Brookings Institution or something like that, and then take into a Democratic administration, and they think we have to create a constituency for this. I mean, should we be looking to movements to push and sort of, you know, I guess you know what I'm saying, like we take from the the public and the organizers rather than give to them? Yeah, it's a it's a very good question. So if you look at where the child tax credit came from, <clears throat> The, the groups that really care about child poverty have been pushing for this for a long time. And there, there were a few champions in Congress like Rosa DeLauro who've been pushing for this forever. And then the stars finally aligned and then they, they, they got it as part of the COVID relief package. So then the question is, <clears throat> unlike Social Security and Medicare, where you have old people and other people who depend on Medicare who are very well organized and you've got AARP and you've got well-established lobbies and then you've got more inside the Beltway kind of lobbies like uh, National Committee for Defense of Social Security and Medicare. You don't have anything like that. I mean, where's the, where is the, the parents lobby for, an, uh, for a universal child allowance? It, it, there's no such organization. And so it, it's not as if this came from the Brookings. I mean, it came from uh, people who've been agitating around child poverty for a very long time, but they didn't connect to a, an organized constituent of beneficiaries, constituency of beneficiaries in the same way as happened with Social Security. But it's a, it's a very interesting political science -y kind of kind of question why why that didn't happen and why one year was too short a time to make it happen. I mean, the minute that that passed, they should have started organizing for constituencies demanding to make it permanent. And, you know, I wasn't in the room, so I don't know exactly why that didn't happen, but it didn't happen. So traditionally, a lot of energy from the working class has come from organized labor and organized labor has obviously been on the decline since 1956 or, I don't know, 1947. We've had some good victories recently, the UAW, obviously, the Teamsters, Starbucks, I guess. But it it's hard for me to believe that we would get back up to a third of the private sector the way it once was. What are your thoughts on the future of the labor movement? And if we don't have as big a labor movement as we once used to, how do you organize the working class? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I think before you look to the future, you got to look a little bit closer at the past. So how did we get to 33% by the by the 40s and 50s? And the answer is, it, it was one part, of course, the Wagner Act and the Great Depression and the, the unionization of industry, but it was one big part World War II where Roosevelt makes a deal with the unions where in exchange for the union leadership enforcing a no strike pledge, Roosevelt agrees to get even tougher with industry. And the rules of the game for defense contracts in World War II are, if you want a defense contract, you got to recognize your union, period. And there are iconic photographs of corporate executives being taken out of their offices in handcuffs for, for trying to break their unions. So the war as a kind of everybody is all in becomes a way to reinforce the power of labor movement. And even though you have Taft-Hartley in 47, after the Republicans take back Congress, you have a kind of an inertial uh, power where Taft-Hartley mainly makes it difficult to organize in, in, in the South, but in the North, while you still have a very strong factory economy, corporate corporate executives basically have concluded that unions are here to stay. We're not going to try to break them. We just got to live with them. And that persists. I mean, the, the one third figure persists all the way into the 60s and really doesn't start declining in a serious way until Reagan breaks the air traffic controller strike and we start losing industry. And then at that point, the gloves are taken off and industry decides to invest very heavily 
in union busting, and it becomes almost impossible to to organize anybody. So now, you know, we've got a friendlier National Labor Relations Board. And, and a lot of this, by the way, a lot of this is union corruption. Not, not union corruption in the Jimmy Hoffa sense, but union corruption in the let's just fight for slightly better contracts for the people who are already members of unions. And let's not go out and try to organize anybody new because that's really hard. And so you had all of these caucuses of incumbents. And it's only with the reform movement in the Teamsters Union and the reform movement in the auto workers where militant guys up from the ranks of the kind that used to be around in the 1930s take over the union and start taking the gloves off and start having some credibility with the rank and file. And so you have this this amazing victory with the Teamsters and, and UPS, followed by this amazing victory uh, with, with the big three in the UAW. So the question is, can they build on that? And you've got a you got a big strike going on in LA right now with hotel workers. You've got these efforts to organize Starbucks and fast food, which is much more difficult because these are much smaller unions, units rather. But I think what it has done is it's given more prestige to the labor movement and it's rekindled a kind of class consciousness. So when you have Biden standing up there with with, with Sean Fain and they're, you know, they're kind of singing solidarity forever together and and the UAW wins a 30 or 40 percent wage increase depending on on how you count it isn't just that working people take another look at the labor movement it's that they take a look another look at class consciousness it's they start thinking in terms of boy it, it isn't it isn't that lgbtq people are screwing me it's that wall street is screwing me and if if, if you're wall street Nothing is is more to your liking than having white working class people fighting over wokeism, because then white working class people don't notice that you're screwing them economically. And so to get back to a kind of salutary class consciousness, some of these union victories help because Sean Fain talks a language of class consciousness, as do the Teamsters and as do hotel and restaurant. And by the way, these are the unions who put people on the doors, as they say, in election campaigns, because organizing to persuade people to come out and vote is not all that different a skill set from organizing people to join the union and to vote for a strike. So it's good for the Democrats to the extent that, that, that organized labor backs the Democrats. But you're absolutely right. There's going to be a long slog because because corporations have learned how to play real hardball. Union busting law firms have have playbooks and it's it's very hard. It's very hard to to make gains. But this is, this is the best thing that's happened to the labor movement in 30 years. So it's you know, it's a little bit of, of good news. Just thinking about the global economy in your book. Can democracy survive global capitalism? You had looked at the, I guess, the Bretton Woods period of the international economy from 1945 to 1972-ish, and then the neoliberal period from then onward. Do you think we are shifting into a new era with increased tariffs? I mean, starting under the Trump administration, but sort of solidified under the Biden administration, industrial policy under the Biden administration. You have the BRICS economies talking about de-dollarization. I feel like I've heard that for a long time, and I've heard countries talk about switching to a basket of currencies for a long time. It doesn't seem to have ever taken on, but you know these economies continue to grow. Are we shifting out of the neoliberal era, or is it too early to tell? Well, there's a there's an economist at, at Harvard who I like very much named Danny Roderick. And, and Roderick talks about hyper-globalization. So if you look at the, the Bretton Woods period, you had globalization, you had a lot of trade, but the rules of the road in that period allowed industrial policies. So if, you know, if, if Germany or France or Italy or Britain wanted to have industrial policies or wanted to have public ownership, they could do that. And it did not violate what was then the GATT, what is now the WTO, 
And so there was a kind of a middle ground where you had, after the war, you had reconstruction, you had a, a rebuilding of trade relationships, but with plenty of room for national sovereignty. And national sovereignty is where political democracy exists. And so if you want to regulate capital, you need a nation state with the capacity to regulate capital. Then you have the neoliberal period where globalization is used to make it more and more difficult for the nation state to regulate capital and, and easier for capital to really bash labor. So now you've got this move somewhat back towards something more like a balance between the power of the nation state, the regulatory power of the nation state to regulate capital, to have industrial policies, to regulate labor. And the Trump version of it was sort of crudely nationalistic. The Biden version of it, I think, is a much more sensible middle ground where you, you do carve out room to have national industrial policies. You, you try and get countries that are democracies, the United States and Western Europe, to have a common set of rules of the road. And China makes it more complicated because China has benefited from the trading system, but doesn't play by the rules of the trading system. And so the question of how you uh, prevent China from taking advantage, but don't get into a shooting war with China, that's a whole other arena of, of conflict. So yeah, I think, I think under Biden, we're pulling back to a more sensible version of, of managed globalization. But if you look at the trade statistics, we have as much trade as we ever did. We, we, we have tariffs on China, which I think is appropriate because the entire Chinese system is an affront to the rules of the trading system. And they also tend to steal intellectual property and they're also a national security problem. But also, by the way, BRICS, you know, that was an acronym coined by a guy at Goldman Sachs. And it's a complete fake. I mean, Brazil- What about the summits they have? It's, it's, it's theater. Think about the members of BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they have absolutely nothing in common. They have completely different economic systems. So yeah, if 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 China's Belt and Road Initiative is going to provide capital investment to other countries, they'll, they'll play the game. And the question of whether you need a basket of currencies, that's been kicking around for a very long time. And despite the fact that the United States you know, runs this horrific chronic trade deficit. The dollar is still king. So I don't I don't I don't know how anybody's going to get together on a on a basket of currencies. I mean the, the BRICS have summits, you know, to make themselves feel good and to kind of suggest that maybe there's a counterweight to Washington. But in terms of of real policies or or in terms of them having any kind of a convergence of how uh, they they apply different rules. They're as different from each other as they are from the United States. One thing they've talked about that they've raised is the U.S. weaponization of the dollar. The examples given how they've done that are uh, sanctions against Iran and like the level of sanctions against Iran. Not that just companies can't operate, U.S. companies can't operate in Iran, but you sort of go three layers out <clears throat> like a company connected to a company connected yep. to a country. And then Russia, I think they excluded from the SWIFT financial system and I, I know the U.S. has been using its hegemony for a long time in the global financial system to sort of influence events. But do you think that there's a, a danger of the U.S. overplaying its hand just in terms of its, its strength in the financial system? It's a very good question. So you, you unpack this, you take them one at a time. Iran, I don't. I don't think India has a ton of sympathy for Iran. I don't think Brazil does. I don't think South Africa does. Russia is sort of making use of Iran. China is kind of trying to play all sides against this. Russia, I mean, if you're the United States of America and and you you had a deal with Iran that was a sensible deal that then Trump uh, walks away from, uh, what do you do? I, I mean, uh, having sanctions against them is probably better than turning loose Netanyahu to bomb. And similarly with Russia, um, you've got a proxy war in Russia. Short of American military going in or short of NATO going in, um, 
making it co more costly for Putin to continue this war via economic sanctions, probably not a bad idea. Uh, the history of sanctions is they work, they work somewhat some of the time. I think the United States tends to exaggerate how effective it thinks sanctions can be. Where have you, you got, seen them work? What? Aside from, where have you seen them work? Aside from South Africa, where have sanctions been effective in changing policy or government? Yeah, so South Africa is the one case where they worked. I think, I think in the case of Iran, uh, squeezing Iran has made it a little bit harder on Iran. But yeah, that's the, 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 the standard wisdom among foreign policy experts is that sanctions for the most part don't work as well as their sponsors think they're going to work. And most of the time they don't work, but occasionally they work. Uh, the, the stars have to align for uh, for sanctions to work. And and of course, the irony with South Africa was it, 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 it wasn't the government. This was civil society creating a sanctions regime. Two countries I'm curious about. I'm, I'm not sure if you're paying too close attention to the economies of Germany and Britain, but I'm sort of fascinated by both of them. So just starting on Germany, they appear to be going through a kind of deindustrialization. They're highly impacted by being cut off from energy from Russia. There also may have been choices that Merkel made in terms of industrial policy and sort of energy production at home. Do you do you have any concern about Germany as being the industrial center of Europe? Is it just going through a sort of bad phase because of Ukraine, or is this portending larger trends for the continent? Yeah, I think you have to differentiate between energy and industry. I think Germany is still a mighty industrial power, and I think German engineering is still the world's best, and Germany has been very cagey in how it is outsourced production. So Germany is very good, and, and, and it's almost like dog whistle. You don't have to tell German CEOs to do this. They just know to do it. Um, so if you look at Slovakia or you look at Hungary or you look at other places that are kind of branch plants of, of Deutschland uh, AG, um, the high end stuff stays in Germany and the components get built in these satellite countries. And this was exactly the same as Hitler's view of how Germany would sort of anchor the whole region. Uh, I'm not attributing a current. German industrial policy to Hitler, but but Germany just has this view that we are the world's best engineers, we make the best stuff, and we're going to keep the high end in Germany, and then, yeah, let's outsource to low-wage countries, but, but let's not do it at the expense of German dominance. And so you've got German chemical industry and pharmaceutical industry and um, all kinds of engineering industries and auto, and I, I don't, I'm not worried about German industry. I think various energy squeezes and dubious decisions that were made, that's a real problem. Now, Britain is a total catastrophe. I mean, Britain bet the farm on being the financial center of Europe, and Britain bet the farm on being a branch plant economy for the rest of Europe. And then along comes Brexit. And Brexit just cuts the leg out from under both aspects of this strategy. And so you've got all these companies that Britain courted now leaving Britain for the continent. And th there's nothing in the offing that is going to replace it. So here you have these working class voters who voted for Brexit in part because of cultural incursions, right? You know, who are these people in my pub speaking this weird language and I don't like them. And partly because of perceived economic incursions, the Polish plumber and all that stuff, but they shot themselves in the foot. I mean, Brexit has been a catastrophe. And the problem with Keir Starmer, the new head of the Labor Party, is he doesn't want to rock the boat. So he he is trying to be all things to all people. He's not saying what he might do about Brexit. He's not saying what he might do about anything. He's just convinced that the Tories are such a catastrophe that if he just doesn't make any enemies, he's going to get elected in the next election. And I, I think, assuming the Labour Party gets in, 
they're absolutely going to have to renegotiate Brexit so that even if they don't rejoin the EU, they have some kind of deal with the EU so that they're, you know, part of the customs union and and they're they're welcoming to to other European based companies. But for now, uh, Britain is just a catastrophe and living standards are going down the drain and their their budget is a mess. Uh, NHS is not in good shape. Well, yeah, but I was I was there last year and I got to tell you, I had some, I don't know, indigestion that somebody thought was a heart attack. And, uh, you know, I, I, I went to the local NHS hospital and I was seen in 20 minutes by totally competent doctors. I got better treatment there than I would have gotten at the Mass General Hospital, which is down the block from my house, and it cost nothing. So so the NHS is running on fumes, and it's still better than American medicine in many respects. So, and that's analogous to your, to your story about the child allowance, that the NHS is so incredibly popular that neither party is, is going to harm the NHS. One would hope, right? I feel like every so often the Tories, I don't know, sort of give indications about it, but they they don't dare. I mean, if you if you want one more nail in the coffin of what's going to happen in the next election, go after NHS. That's just perfect. <laughs> so you teach part time at Brandeis. Brandeis just, I think, fully disbanded students for Palestinian justice. I don't. I may not have the. The name of the organization, right. right? I know you had posted on the American Prospect that you disagreed with that decision. I'm wondering what you make of the approach to free speech all around campuses and in political life. It seems like there is a really strong movement on the right. We have to have free speech. We we shouldn't censor things, you know, blah blah, because these liberals are crying about safe spaces and they can't hear, hear things against BLM or transgender issues. But as soon as it's about Israel. We've got to shut all these groups down. Having been a professor for a long time, what do you make of how that is on campus life and then how that affects the sort of general political life? Yeah, I think it's a nightmare. I think it's an absolute nightmare. And I think by trying to shut down speech, you 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 hand the leadership to the most radical people around who are most willing to use speech to intimidate and harass, whether it's uh, pro-Israel or whether it's anti-Israel, it, it's uh, or, or, or it's a complete nightmare. And I think the left is partly to blame for this be, by going so nuts about politically correct speech. So, you know, here we have been so sensitized to microaggressions. Here's a macroaggression. You know, here comes full on anti-Semitism where and, and the biggest single cause of the anti-Semitism is Netanyahu by complete, conflating criticism of Israel with, you know, anti-Zionism is the same as anti-Semitism or criticizing the way Israel treats Arabs in the occupied territories of the West Bank. Oh, that's anti-Semitism. So you're, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where, where the best friend of all anti-Semites all over the world right now is Netanyahu. And then on the other hand, you've got some of the pro-Palestinian groups really making explicit threats against Jews on campus. So it's what happens is any sense of nuance, any sense of dialogue just completely goes down the drain. And so the President Brandeis, the president of, of Columbia, they they try to damp this down by kicking the, the pro-Palestinian group off campus. And all that does is pour oil on the flames, right? It makes it makes these universities a magnet for, okay, we'll do civil disobedience, arrest us. And it just escalates the thing. So for someone who who prizes a college as a place where you can actually talk about stuff, this kind of polarization is is just a nightmare. And it, it's 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 blowback, right? It's blowback from what's going on in the Middle East compromising the United States of America, where there used to be a fair amount of respect for free speech, a fair amount of respect for dialogue, a fair amount of respect for diversity. And I don't, you know, other other than Biden saying to the Israelis, if you want our gazillions of dollars, the first thing that has to happen is Netanyahu has to step down. So, so other than 
other than Israel having less in the way of policies that 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 just act like a lightning rod for all this stuff. I don't know how you solve this on American campuses, but it's it's very depressing. Bob, I really appreciate your time. Probably could have gone another two hours because I. Could have. This was. The, <laughs> this was I know it's all over the map, literally. Well, and thank you for thank you for doing me the courtesy of reading my stuff, which, which made for an even better informed conversation. I appreciate that. I work hard. Thank you.